Those of you joining us online, you're about to step into the double of God, the divine double as he exchanges your ashes for his beauty, your shame for his anointing. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to prophesy to three people and tell them you've just received double. And Evan, you're going to have to bring that in a little tighter, I do believe. If you're watching online, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. We want to stand in faith with you for revival in your house. Yeah, breathe it in. Breathe in the double. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There ought to be a steady rumble in this place throughout the whole service. Hallelujah. Hmm. The Gospel of John, chapter number 16. The Gospel of John, chapter number 16. If you've got your Bible, turn there. How do you know if the Spirit of God is in your midst. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? How do you receive the Holy Spirit? These are some things that I want to discuss with you for a few moments here this morning. But as we do, I want us to do it together recognizing that we have already asked the Holy Spirit to invade this place. And as a result, at any moment, at any time, he can do anything that he wants to do. Your healing is most likely to show up in a part of the service you least expect it. Begin to search for him in every moment. Begin to search for him with every syllable that is uttered, with every amen that comes out of your mouth, with every hallelujah or luya that happens on the left or to the right. Begin to search for his moving. And when he moves, you move. Do not become a passive people because you sit in chairs as if you have gathered to hear something. No doubt we have gathered to hear something, but it's more than hearing, is it? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God that even as you sit there and the sound reverberates through the PA system or online, something more significant is happening. An exchange is taking place. As you yield your ear, he is releasing the exchange of faith into your heart. The Gospel of John, chapter number 16, and let's, let's read this passage of Scripture, and then we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. John, chapter 16, and verse number 7. If you're there, say yes. yes. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. That ought to get a hallelujah out of your mouth. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Amen. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. All things the Father has are mine. Hallelujah. Therefore said I, he will take what is mine and will show it unto you. Amen. Holy Spirit, we recognize your presence here. We discern it. We sense it. We understand it. Now do what you came to do. Reveal Jesus to us. Make him real and make all that he possesses more real to us than our own possessions. Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we may see, that we may know, that we may perceive and understand, that we may apprehend that which you have laid out for us. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. 
And with that revelation, let there be transformation for our homes, for our nation. Oh, God, we lift up this nation to you right now. We humble ourselves before you and we say, Father, invade this nation with your Holy Spirit. Let us become willing vessels that carry your glory and the manifestation of your presence everywhere we go from the church house to the White House. I thank you, Lord, that even now your spirit is infiltrating every part of our government. Convicting hearts, transforming lives. Let there be conspicuous conversions. I don't know if I got anybody praying with me or not. Let there be, con come on, somebody stand in faith with me. Let there be conspicuous conversions in seats of power all across the nation and around the world. Let there be dynamic transformations that take place as politicians bow their knee. Let preachers be baptized in fire as they stand in their pulpits even this day. Let an anointing come from heaven and fill the place where they are preaching. Let them be surprised by the Holy Spirit. Oh, let it surprise us too, God. Let it surprise the person sitting next to us. Let it surprise the person that's watching online. Let there be an electric atmosphere that surrounds them as the intensity and the manifestation of your glory increases in this moment. God, let it be. Holy Spirit invade and have your way. Do it your way, not our way. Do it your way. In 1950, an evangelist who has now become a household name stood behind a pulpit in a massive stadium in Los Angeles, California. As he stood behind that pulpit, he said, the fact that some of us believe one thing and some another about the Holy Spirit does not do away with the fact that God says, be ye filled with the Spirit. He began to preach and say that I understand this is a controversial issue and that there are many different people who, who perceive the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and is working in different ways. But he said, I believe that this is the greatest need of the church today. Everywhere I go, he said, I find God's people in lack, in torment, in defeat, there is a great need, an insecurity, a defeat. And he said, I'm going to put my finger on the reason for this defeat in the lives of Christians right now. He said, you Christians must be filled with the Spirit. Talking to a stadium of tens upon tens of thousands of people, Billy Graham stood and said, you Christians, are you filled with the Spirit? If you are not, he said, you are in sin. He went on to talk about how once he had visited a church where a deacon had walked in the Sunday morning service where he was preaching, and the deacon walked in intoxicated and drunk. And so the church, he said, rightly excommunicated him because the deacon ought to know better. But he turned to the pastor and said, how many of your deacons show up every Sunday morning filled with the Spirit? He said, do they always show up filled with the Spirit? And the deacon had to humbly bow his head and said, no, they don't. He said, then you must remember the rest of the verse because the same verse that says, be not drunk with wine, also says, be ye filled with the Spirit. And so I ask you what Billy Graham asked them those many decades ago, are you filled? Not frilled, not entertained. Are you, I'm not asking you, were you? 
You see, the purpose of a vessel is to carry a thing. Huh? We are here vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, but we are all vessels. We are all carriers. And so our purpose is to get filled with something to carry it to what end? We carry it so that we might pour it out. Once it is poured out, that vessel, in order for it to fulfill its purpose, must once again be filled. And so I'm not asking you, have you been filled with the Spirit? Many a preacher today are struggling as the gears of their ministry are grinding because there's no oil in the machinery of what they're trying to do. There's no anointing that's causing, and as a result, they are burning out because they were once filled with the Holy Spirit, and they did. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You can be filled, and God call you to do something, and you go do it, and you succeed, and then you go to do it again, and you fail. And you're over here and you're doing what you know God has called you to do. You know, you know what he told you to do. In fact, you did it over there and he blessed what you did. But over here, it seems to be without fruit. Something is happening. What has happened? Over here, you poured it out. And in between here and there, you did not get refilled. Are you filled? I don't ask you if you have the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. None of us are without him. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is with us. He is, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, in us. But this is the question, is he on you? Terry, Jesus said to the disciples who had spent three years with him. Three years with him was not enough. The Holy Spirit can do in what moment what three years with the Son of God cannot do. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit can do in one moment what three years with Jesus could not do. Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. There is a power. People often ask me, what is my favorite verse in the Bible? I don't really have an answer for that. It's the one I need at the moment. But if you were to ask me what my favorite chapter in the Bible is, that is an easy question for me to answer because that chapter is Acts chapter number 19. It is my favorite chapter of the Bible because it's radical. It's wild. It starts in Acts chapter 19 with the Apostle Paul showing up at Ephesus with some disciples of Jesus who have been baptized. They love the Lord. And he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It's a wild question to ask. And it is the evangelistic question of the hour in this nation. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, then what were you baptized? We were baptized in the name of Jesus in water. He laid his hands on them that they might receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is amazing to me that those who will accept John's statement that you shall be baptized with water cut out the last part of the statement and fire. For I truly baptize you with water and churches all across the county and around the nation and around the world will get buckets of water and dunk you in it all day long. But they leave off the last, the last part. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 19 has this radical description of the disciples at Ephesus who received the Holy Ghost after salvation. And then it goes into this piece of cloth that's taken from Paul's body handkerchiefs and aprons, and they lay it on the oppressed, and they're set free, and the sick, and they're healed. At the same time, there's the seven sons of Sceva who are trying to cast out devils in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, and then that devil jumps on them and tears them up. It's, I always have this picture of a ring, and in one quarter, you have the seven sons of Sceva, which represent the religious understanding of deliverance and the religious understanding of Christianity and who are just parroting what they have heard. And then in one corner, you, in the other corner, you have a handkerchief. 
seven men against one devil, and they get their tails whooped up on. They take one piece of cloth, and they lay it on somebody, and they're free. Radical, right? It's wild. Why the comparison? Why are those two stories put back to back so you can see with the anointing, nothing is impossible. And yet without the anointing, you could have a team of seven men, and it will accomplish nothing. Are you filled? It is the question of the hour. Filled at salvation, you understand, at salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit within you, but that impacts you. What's within a glass has no impact on anything else. In order for it to benefit the person holding the glass or the people around or the elements around, that glass must overflow. And when it overflows, when what in, what's in gets out, that's when you see a revival. For many who are struggling with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence that follows it, this is the reason why they struggle, because they have not yet been filled. They have only been frilled. <laughs> they have received a little dab will do you. And then they don't understand where their prayer language is. It's in the overflow. You ever tried to pour water in a bucket with a hole in it? At some point, you can reach a saturation point where it doesn't matter how much you pour in, that bucket will never be full unless you increase the intensity of the outpouring. Does it make sense to you? So if you want the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, you must plug the hole so that your bucket can fill to overflowing. Okay. Hallelujah. You Christians, are you filled with the Spirit? If not, you're sinning against God. Billy Graham. Ezekiel chapter 37 pictures a valley full of dry bones. The sinews and the parts have all come together. The bones have come together. The flesh has come on the bones, and yet still all we have is a dead army. This is the picture of the majority of the members of the church today. We have everything. We have bone. We have flesh. We have methods. We have systems. We have machinery, money, subscribers. We have everything except the breath of the Almighty God. We have everything except the fullness to the overflow of the Holy Spirit. In the first chapters of Matthew and of Luke, we see that the womb of Mary was barren until she was endued with power from the Holy Spirit and new life sprang forth. You want a generation to discover Jesus? You want to give birth to a revival? You must receive the overshadowing, overflowing power of the Holy Spirit in your life. 120 in the upper room were afraid and powerless, just like today's church is powerless. But they received the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, be ye, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. It's true, though, isn't it? We gather. We have prayer meetings, Sunday school classes, board meetings, entire Bible colleges, even revival meetings without the fullness of the Spirit present. In 2 Kings chapter number 6, there's a story. They had come to a place where the place they were in was too small for their ministry. Can you relate? The place they were in was too small for their ministry, and so they began to build. And as they were building, they were felling trees, and one of the gentlemen, as he's chopping down a tree, the axe head falls off of the axe, and it falls into the water. Yes? And what does he do? If he was a part of the modern church, I'll tell you what he'd do. He'd just keep on swinging. What if that gentleman, imagine... What if that gentleman never knew the axe had left and he just kept swinging and for faithfulness sake, just to be faithful, he just keeps doing what God's called him to do. He just keeps doing, just keeps swinging, just keeps swinging, just keeps swinging. What's going to happen to him? He's going to get frustrated. He's going to get burnt out. 
He's going to lash out at people around him. I'm talking about modern day ministry. As people just, they just, they're being faithful. They keep doing what they know God's called them to do. They know we, he's given us the great commission. They know he's called us to take care of the poor. They know he's called us to do all these things. But then we're lashing out at one another. We're not walking in peace. We're not walking in joy. We're not walking in grace. Why? Because a long time ago, we lost our axe head. And so we're not seeing the fruit of the effort that we should be seeing. And it is not a shame to say, wait a second, I'm not seeing what the Bible says I should be seeing. Maybe I've lost my axe head. He runs to the prophet and said, the axe head's gone and it was borrowed. A lot of ministries done on debt today. And it was borrowed. What did the prophet do? Well, he threw a stick in the water. He talks about the cross. And something that normally floats sank so that something that normally sinks could float. And at the cross, the Son of God took his righteousness and exchanged it for your unrighteousness. That you might receive the promise of the Spirit. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Oh, how we need to pray that God would make the axe head float again. That in our lives first, individually and personally, God, we've lost our axe head. Would you help us? Would you help us? Would you cause that thing to float so that we could take it up again and apply it to what you've called us to do? Would you do that, God? Over the next 35 days as we prepare for Pentecost, would you cause us to regain our axe head? Pentecost Sunday night, we're going to be gathered here, and I'm going to have Duncan and Kate Smith join us, Pentecost Sunday night, <laughs> from the Toronto outpouring, Duncan and Kate Smith are going to be here Pentecost Sunday night, and the axe head's going to float. Something we've been missing, something we've lost, something we've needed is going to come to the surface, and we're going to put that thing back on the axe. And in the name of Jesus, Pentecost Sunday night, in this place, it gets restored to us. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may say, I, I know, I know, all I know is that I don't want to live this life on a roller coaster. You may say, listen, I, I'm, I don't want to be up and down. I don't want to be tempted. I don't want to live in defeat. I don't want to have to, be, I don't have to be overpowered by this temptation. So I don't, I don't want to be overcome anymore. I don't want to struggle in a powerless life anymore. I do, I do want to be filled with the Spirit. And my response is, do you? Really? Do you Really? Do you really want to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Do you really want power to be a witness? Do you really? Are you willing to suffer the persecutions that it will entail? If you really want it, if you say, yes, I want it, then you can have it, but it's going to cost you something. There's a price. But if you're willing to pay the price, then I guarantee you on the authority of the Word of God, all of this blessing I'm talking about will be yours. You will have double manifestation and double multiplication in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. The question is, do you really want it? Some of you sound like you're not too sure. <laughs> and I'm glad. I'm glad you're questioning yourself. I want you to really search your heart and say, do I want it? Do I want the Lord to come? Because we read in, in John 16, and we talked about it last week, when the Holy Spirit shows up, what's the first thing he does? He convicts us of sin. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, no, step number one, be cleansed of your sin. You're not shouting as much right now. Be cleansed. He demands holiness. Be ye therefore holy. For I, says the Lord, am holy. Confess your sins. And immediately you start thinking of sins of greed and pride and lust. But I want to first talk about sins of omission. That if you will plug these holes, you can receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about sins that will rob you of overflowing with this anointing, starting with ingratitude. 
It's the whole of gratitude stifling your ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you thankful for the sun in the sky and for the breeze on your forehead? Are you thankful for the rain when it falls? Are you thankful for what God has given you, or are you simply complaining about what you do not have? Ingratitude will rob you of the presence of the Holy Spirit about as quick as anything else. Somebody just say, thank you, Lord. What's another sin? How about a lack of a love for God? We don't talk about these things, you know. It's always somebody else's egregious sin in Hollywood. You know, they slap somebody on stage. What about your lack of love for God? How about that? I was, I was interviewing a gentleman uh, last week. He, he wrote a book called Kicking the Stars. Kicking the Stars. I said, is this an autobiography about Will Smith? Is that what this is? No, it was about reaching for, anyway, that'll be coming out later. It was a lot of fun. Ingratitude, a lack of love for God. How would you like it if your spouse spent as much time with you as you do with God? Hmm. A lack of love for God. Do you spend any time with him? Do you, do you talk with him? Do you walk with him? If not, I got news for you. It's a sin. Hmm. Go back to adultery, Pastor Allen. Talk about that. <laughs> How about this? The neglect of the Word of God. Jesus says that He measures your love for Him based on your love for His Word. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. How are you going to keep them if you don't read them? Hmm. A lack of love for the word is sin. It is a hole in your bucket that as I stand here even now and try to pour and pour and pour to fill you up to get to the point of overflow, these holes of ingratitude, a lack of love for God, a lack of love for the Word, these things are hindering you, but if you'll just repent and say, cover it, Lord, fill me up to overflowing, wash me in the blood of your Son, Jesus, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to do it. Amen. And you'll find yourself filled up quicker than you could possibly imagine. How about this sin, unbelief? Nobody wants to talk about that anymore. Unbelief. Unbelief is the equivalent of calling God a liar. When you do not trust him, when you do not believe him, you are saying, I think you're a liar. It's a hole in the bucket. God, fill it up, let it overflow. How about the neglect of prayer? God forbid that I should sin against you by failing to pray for you, the Bible says. The neglect of prayer. And then when you get in trouble, you're like, oh, Lord, fill me. you got too many holes in your bucket. You are not condemned to keep these holes by acknowledging them, by repenting of them. Repenting, you understand, is a renunciation. It is not just an I'm sorry. It is a turning away from I will never do that thing again, and I will never look at that thing the way that I used, the way that I used to. Here's another one, the failure to attend church. Ooh, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and even the more so. I'm still quoting Billy Graham, by the way. These are all points Billy Graham made, just in case someone wanted to argue with me. You're not arguing with me. You're arguing with Billy Graham. And if that's a problem, if that's not a problem, you're arguing with the word if you have a problem with it. Okay. How about a lack of passion for souls? Neglecting your family duty as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a father, as a these are just the egregious sins that you, th and you thought I was going to talk about the sins of commission, which we could certainly do. How about worldliness? Pride. Envy. Greed. Slander. 
gossip. Well, it's not gossip if it's true. Yes, it is. Gossip is not defined by the truth of the thing. Gossip is defined by who you're sharing it with and for what purpose. If you're not sharing it with someone who can fix the problem, it's gossip, even if it's true. Lying. I'll be there at 1030. You show up at 1045. You always think I'm going to go in a different direction. How about cheating at Monopoly? <laughs> That'll test your Christianity right there. Monopoly. We just played Albemarle Monopoly in my house. It'll test your righteousness. <laughs> I won, but anyway. <laughs> I not only won, I crushed everyone. I owned every single property on the board by the time it was all said and done. Come on, somebody talk to me. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. For my family that's here, I thought they would like you to know that. <laughs> For those of you online who didn't hear that, good. <laughs> the devil will get you. <laughs> He's a sneaky devil. <laughs> Hallelujah. But do you see what I'm saying? I'm not sharing these things with you to condemn you. I'm trying to show you you are on the verge, on the edge of one of the greatest outpourings of the Holy Spirit the world has ever seen. I really believe that. I believe we're about to see a mighty convergence of the camps and with it a convergence of anointings that's going to turn the streams into a river that's going to saturate the world we now live in. This is our moment. This is our time. And it's time we rise up and take possession of the righteousness of God and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say hallelujah. We're talking about bringing our sins because we know he will cover all of our sins. Amen. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Be cleansed of your sin and then be consecrated unto him. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto his name. Not just some, but all of me, God. All of me for all of you. What an exchange. What an exchange. Imagine talking with a millionaire and saying, I'll give you all my money for all your money. And he says, that sounds like a good deal to me. And he takes your $100 and he gives you $10 million. All of me, God, for all of you. But we don't do that with God. Can you imagine looking to rent a home? And you need a home for you and your children to be in. And you need a good priced home, and you need to find something that's going to work for you. And this gentleman comes to you and says, listen, I've got this great home. It's a little small, a little compact, but I think it will work good for your needs. Tell you what, you can stay there for free. I just need one room for me. You can have the whole house. I just need one room set aside for me. So you get the living room. You get the bedroom. You get the bathroom. You get the kitchen. You get the dining room. I'll even furnish it all for you. You can have it all. You get the TV, the refrigerator, the washer, and the dryer. I just need this one little room. That's for me. And you say, well, what is that room going to be for? He said, well, I'm going to use it for an infectious disease lab. You going to take your family to stay there? This is what we do with God. Come in, God. Come into my life, and you can have everything except this. Just this one room. I'm just, I need that for me. And what you don't realize is it is an infectious disease lab that will eventually contaminate the rest of the house, and he will not do it. God wants all of us every room, everything, every aspect of our lives. Sometimes we feel like we're not trusting others when really what we're doing is we're not trusting God. Just to give that over to him and say, have your way in all my life. So the question is, are you holding anything back? Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? Are you holding anything back? He can't fill what you've already filled. Hmm, that's so good. How can I know if I am filled with the Holy Spirit? 
Number one, a man with an unclean spirit does unclean things. A man with an evil spirit does evil things. Someone with the Holy Spirit does holy things. Are you filled with the Spirit? I don't know. Is there an inner drive within you to be holy? And when you're not, do you feel it deep and hard? Are you filled with the Spirit? Are you hungry for holiness? Are you filled with the Spirit? Jesus said, you shall receive power to be witnesses. Are you a bold witness for Jesus Christ everywhere that you go? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, tenderness, meekness, gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit. Does God have first place in your life? This is why Spirit-filled people are so perceived as being radical because they put God first. This can seem and appear complicated, especially when you're juggling a lot of different priorities in your life, but it doesn't have to be. And I see so many people trying to do this, and they're trying to juggle, and they, is it, is it, you know, is it family, God, and then job? Is it, is it family, job, and then God? Is it God, and then family, and then job? It, it's, all of that is wrong. That's not how you prioritize your life. It is your family, and then you put God first in your family. It is your job, and then you put God first in your job. You understand? So it's not like God and then my job. It is, is he first in my job? Is he first in my relationships? Is he first in my family? And if he is not, that could be a sign that you have a hole in your bucket and that you are not currently filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody grab me a bottle of water. I think we got plenty of them. And remove the top for me. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Thank you very much. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you have it back there in the Amplified Bible, I want 1 Corinthians 2.14. We'll read it in the King James and then I'll read it in the Amplified. 1 Corinthians 2. And verse 14. How do you get filled with the Spirit? Stop being natural. Here's what it says in the King James, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now it's, it's 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So a natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. Well, that doesn't make sense, Pastor. I don't know. If I'm, if I'm a natural person and I want spiritual things, how do I become spiritual so I can receive spiritual things? Jesus. Jesus is our access into spiritual things. He is our spirit guide. <laughs> our guide into spiritual things, and he guides us and leads us into all truth, including the spirit of truth. Here's what it says in the Amplified Version of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Do you have it on the screen for them? 1 Corinthians 2, 14? Yeah, I want to read it up here. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with them, because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, discerns all things, yet he himself is to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. 
Uh, there is a depth that comes when you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit that no one can judge because no one knows or understands except God himself. But that can only come by humbling ourselves and yielding ourselves to the Spirit of God. How do we receive it? Here's what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you received Jesus Christ, so walk in him. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? How did you receive Jesus? How you receive Jesus is a definition of our walk, what it looks like from here on out. So how you receive Jesus is how you receive prosperity. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You believe, you speak, you apprehend and receive. And the same is true with healing. You believe in your heart, you speak with your mouth, you take possession of it, and it becomes yours. The same is true for prosperity. You believe it in your heart, you speak it with your mouth, and you take possession of it, it becomes yours. And when it comes to the blessed Holy Spirit and the infilling that he has promised, you must believe. Believe in your heart that it has been promised, that it is available to all who ask. You must believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, then take possession of it as your own. As you receive Jesus, so walk in him. It's that simple. Did you have to work to receive Jesus? Then you don't have to work to receive the Holy Spirit. Did you have to get your life right before you receive Jesus? that you don't have to do everything to get everything right in order to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Did you have to do any type of works or, or things of the law in order to receive Jesus? Then you don't have to. Did you have to tarry to receive Jesus? Then you don't have to tarry to receive the Holy Spirit or his infilling or his overflowing. Sad reality is, is that you can be a minister, an experienced Christian. You can be someone who has had encounters with God and be sitting here today listening to this, watching this, and you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean to overflowing. I don't know about you. Even if I'm filled, listen, this isn't doing me any good, especially if I want to water some plants until it comes out. Is that right? Now, here's the one thing that you can be sure of. Once it's filled, here's another sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Once it's filled to the brim, one thing you can be sure of, if it's bumped, this is 100% this is natural spring water, established in 1873. 100% natural spring water. If this bottle gets bumped, one thing you can be sure of is polluted water is not coming out. This is clean, pure water. You bump me, unpure water doesn't come out. Are you filled with the Spirit? I don't know. When you get bumped, anybody can sing a, new, a tune on a clear day at noon. I'm talking about at midnight. When trouble's all around, you done stub your toe, you're trying to figure out how to pay your bills, and the dog is going crazy, and you get bumped, what comes out of you? Gratitude, holiness, righteousness, praise unto the name of God. If not, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're filled with other things. Do you hear what I'm saying? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. When people get filled with wine, they can't stop talking. You know, everything they do is corrupted by it, polluted by it. Their, their senses, everything is, is altered by it. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, everything is corrupted by it. Everything is cleansed by it. Everything is affected. The way you speak, the way you talk, the way you act. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit or are you filled with wrath? Well, that's not like me. Yes, it is. It's just like you. Everybody knows it but you. I didn't mean to say that. You did mean to say that. It had to be, in order to come out, it had to be an overflow. Amen. Nothing comes out unless it's overflow. You understand that? Nothing comes out of your mouth unless it's overflow. I'll 
Pastor, I've been, I want to pray in the Holy Ghost. You must get to the point of overflow. How do I do that? As you receive Christ, so walk in him. You humbly submit yourself to him and recognize there are holes in your bucket that are keeping you from being filled in the way that he wants you to be filled. And you repent and you trust in him to seal up all those holes. And when you do, he will be faithful to do what he promised to do. Everybody stand up on your feet just for a moment. I want us to pray. I want to pray for people who want to be filled. This is a video that 10 years from now will still be available for people to hear this teaching and to receive this and to be filled. So let's pray. Even if you are filled, let that overflow begin to operate in your life right now as we begin to stand in faith and believe God for a breakthrough in this moment. This is not just a change in the service and how things are going. This is a moment of breakthrough for many people who are tired of struggling with a half-filled life. It's time for us to plug the holes. There was a young, young boy who they were visiting an antique shop and he he was with his mother, and he stuck his hand into a vase, vase. Depends on how expensive it is, right? And he got his hand stuck in that vase, and they couldn't get it out. Very expensive. They didn't want to break it. They tried oil. They tried everything they could, and, but just could not get that boy's hand. They called the fire department. The fire department tried everything that they could. They said, the only thing we know is we're going to have to, we're gonna have to break this thing. And finally, the little boy said, um, Mama, would it help if I let go of the penny? He had found a penny at the bottom of the vase, had grabbed it, and was concerned that if he let go, he wouldn't be able to get the penny. And some of you are stuck in a situation because there's something you don't want to let go of. But if you'll let go, he will fill you to overflow. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Is there something in your life keeping you from being filled? When I say three, I want you to raise your hand in the air, and we're going to pray it gets plugged up, that every hole in your life that's keeping you from being filled will be plugged up in the name of Jesus, and you will be cleansed from all unrighteousness, cleansed from all sin, and we're going to commit our lives holy and new to the presence of God in this place, believing for a Pentecostal outpouring. And as we've received Christ, we're going to walk with him today in the name of Jesus, and we're about to experience overflow. When I say three, you want that overflow. I want you to raise your hand in the air. One, two, three, raise it in the air right now, right now, right now. Yeah, if we're all, all honest, we got holes. We got holes in the name of Jesus. Ah, something's happening already. The moment you lifted your hands, I felt something. I felt something. He's already plugging them up right now. If you be faithful to confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive you of all unrighteousness. This is your moment to get that ingratitude out of the way. This is your moment to get all those things, a lack of love for him that you've displayed throughout the weeks, a lack of love for his word. Confess it before him right now and tell him you want him to fill you to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Ooh. I haven't been showing your love to my family the way I should, God. Plug that hole now in the name of Jesus. I repent of it. I turn from it. I haven't been the father, the wife, the mother, the husband that I should be. Help me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. See, that is the prayer that will bring the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Jesus called him the helper. And when you recognize your need and you say, help me, you are calling on the name of the Holy Spirit. His name is help. And if you stand here today and you are in need and you need him to do something for you, I dare you to ask him to help. I dare you to call out to him because you know in this moment that is his name. His name is help. His name is help, 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 help me. Help me love your word more. Help me to love you more. Help me to serve you. Help me to show your love. Help, 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 help. Now say this with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus, and I repent, I renounce my sin. I plead the blood of Jesus and trust in his resurrection. I receive right now 
the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Every hole has been plugged, so I receive the overflow. Jesus, you are the baptizer. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit now. I receive it by faith, and I thank you for it. Now lift your hands and receive it. Yeah, yeah. As an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, in his name and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I say, be filled now. Be filled. Ha, ah, ah. ha. Open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit begin to talk through you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit now, 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 now be filled. Let your overflow begin to f affect the person next to you. Be filled to overflowing. Be filled to overflowing. Something's rising in here. Come on, something's rising. Go Yeah, 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 lift that voice, lift that voice. Let the Holy Spirit fill this atmosphere through you. Become a funnel for him to move, a vessel for him to carry his glory. Begin to write in the comments, I receive in the name of Jesus. Then lift your hands and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go, ho, ho. When I say now, I want you to shout hallelujah. Now. Hallelujah! Now the same volume right now, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, that same volume. Let's consecrate and seal this moment right now. Get out of your seat if you need to and walk around. Get at the altar, but pray in the Holy Ghost. That same volume. There you go. This is what you do when the enemy comes after you. This is what you do when he squeezes you. Let that Holy Ghost come out of you. When the curse of this world squeezes you, let the Holy Ghost come out of you. Come on, take a second, take a second, take a second. You spent too much time worrying. You need to take a minute, pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, now, lay your hands on your belly. Lay your hands on your belly. And say, I am not, I am not a, natural man. a natural man. Say, I refuse, I refuse to, be a to be a natural person. I am, I am a, Holy a Holy Ghost person. You cut me, you cut me. I bleed Holy Ghost. Bleed Holy Ghost. Born, Born, bred, bred. Holy, Ghost. Holy Ghost. I am. I See, you need to understand something. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are the church. You understand that? That's the church. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, the gifts of healing, the gift of faith, the gift of the working of miracles. That's the church. In combination with the fruit of the Spirit, that is a description of our reflection of the ministry of Jesus. And we're going to be teaching on the gifts of the Spirit extensively, extensively. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We might call last-minute extra sessions to just gather in here one night and just be instructed on the word of knowledge. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now seal it in us, God. 
Seal it in us. Seal it in us. Let us bear fruit worthy of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Let us be bold in our witness. Let our hunger for holiness be steadfast and true. Let our desire for the word increase. Let our love for one another be evident. We receive your double for our shame today. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, celebrate the name of the Lord and love on him. Now it's time for this morning's tithes and offerings. Woo! You may be seated. Get your tithes and offerings ready. Those of you that are watching online, you can go to EncounterToday.com. Now listen, this is really important. We have just changed giving systems. And so you may have to fill out if, you, if you're, you know, not logged in, if you'd like to be logged in. This is going to help us so much and make giving so much easier, help us to get all the information that we need so much easier, an amazing company that we're working with. And so we want you to make sure this new system is called Virtuous. So refresh the web page and the app to see the updates under giving. It may be if, you're, if your website hasn't already refreshed itself, if your page is always there. Like Encounter Today is like always on my phone. <laughs> so I have to refresh it to make sure it gets the update. And it's the same as true with your app. It's a whole new giving system, and it's, it's amazing what we're going to be able to do to be a blessing to you and to others, and even to disciple people through this new giving system. So we appreciate you working with us as we, trans, as we you know, make this transition, because uh, it's going to be different. We're not using Planning Center anymore. We don't have text to give uh, as an option any longer, So at least for now, as we make this transition. So if you're used to using Planning Center on your phone or if you're using text to give then we're making a transition. So you got to go to EncounterToday.com or go to the Encounter Today app uh, to, to do the new style of giving. And we're so excited about it. How long have we spent preparing for this, Katie? Five or six months getting these systems in place because it's, it's bigger than you can possibly know what we're doing behind the scenes and, and I hope one day, maybe one day I'll take time to explain it to you, but it's huge, and it's going to mean a world of difference for us and for you and for the kingdom. So help us preach the gospel around the world. Go to EncounterToday.com and give as you're led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And as you're making your gift ready, I want to make sure that you vote on May 17th here locally, right? That's where the primaries are here locally. Is that correct? May the 17th. And then June the 15th. Candace Smithyman, that's a Wednesday night. Candace Smithyman is going to be here for a special revival service. So get on a plane, train, automobile. You get her and I together in the same room, a portal's going to open. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's going to be wild. And you want to talk about wild, let's talk about Pentecost Sunday, June the 5th. We'll be here at 1030 a.m., but Sunday night at 7 p.m., I'll be here along with Kate and Duncan Smith are going to be here with us for our Pentecost celebration. How many of you excited about that? <laughs> Woo, that's going to be wild. And then on Monday, I'm going to do an interview with them. We're going to talk with them all day, and I'm going to go through all of the Toronto outpouring and all of the, you know, all the gossip about it. We're going to clear the air and make everything clear, and it's going to be amazing getting Word of Faith and Classical Pentecost together with that, you know, offshoot of Vineyard and, and uh, that Toronto outpouring, bringing those camps together, it's going to be an answer to prayer. So that's going to be uh, June, the, June the 5th at 7 p.m., and it's going to be amazing. You got your gifts ready? Father, in the name of Jesus now, we bring our offering to you. This could be the most important part of the service. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. As we give in response to the word that we've received, we do so with jubilation. We do so with thanksgiving. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together, to hear this word together here and online. Thank you that we could be a part of this together. And we bring this offering in response to your word. We bring it in response to the moving of your spirit on the inside of us. We give it in faith, and we believe for a mighty increase, a multiplication to take place as we sow into the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Multiply, not just 30, not just 60, a hundredfold in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody who means it, say amen. 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 Give us unto the Lord as the ushers come to receive your offering. Uh, a couple other quick announcements. 
Um, I gave a word about an exchange taking place, exchanging your shame. And those of you that are watching online, get ready for this. I'm about to interview a, a tremendous woman of God named Catherine Ruanala. How many of you have never heard of Catherine Ruanala? Never heard. How many of you have heard of Catherine Ruanala? Uh, okay, so this is going to be a game changer for you. Game changer for you. She's written an amazing book called Double for Your Trouble, which I got after I received the word concerning this season that we were entering into the double. And I've been feeding my spirit on it, and I'm going to be talking with her. I think it will be this Wednesday when we're going to release that. And I'm going to be talking with her about that exchange rate between your shame and God's double. And we're going to discuss that on Encounter Today. And then on the podcast, she is known for cultivating a prophetic culture. She is internationally known, has, has amazing TV programs, but the culture she's cultivated concerning the prophetic and how to manage that within a local church community, we're going to talk about that on the podcast. What does that look like practically? How does everybody know what's okay and what's not okay? You know, how do we, how do we create that culture? We're going to talk about that on Encounter Today. So that's going, to be, that's going to be a really key interview. You may stand up on your feet. I feel so official when I say that. You may stand on your feet. All rise. The judge is in session. Or the court is in session. Now presiding, Judge Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your body. Thank you for the ability to gather with one another, to love one another, to share, to encourage, to prophesy, to bless one another. As we leave here today, let us do so with the understanding of how unique this is, how valuable it is. Let us do it with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said